All right. Well, it looks like it is 11 o'clock and I'm going to jump right in because we have a lot to cover today um, about work campers. So I just first of all want to um, thank everybody um, for joining us. This is Diana Kelly, President and CEO of Camp Cal Now RV Park and Campground Alliance. We are the association that represents all the RV parks and campgrounds throughout the state. And the reason that they are still open and considered essential. Um, so don't forget to thank your association. Today we have with us Dan Ruttero. Dan is our lead legal expert here at the association and his law firm represents the owners and managers of RV communities throughout California. Dan's practice includes preparing rental agreements, park rules, assisting with day-to-day -day management, answering a ton of questions from the association and operational issues um, at a park. This firm also represents park communities and litigation cases, including eviction and rent control. Uh, we also have with us today a special guest, Damian Petty, who's a commercial insurance agent for Levitt Recreation and Hospitality Insurance. Um, Damian has more than 20 years of experience and specializes in anything recreational, including, but not limited to, RV parks and campgrounds. Um, Damian is licensed in over 20 states, but um, primarily works the western portion of the country. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this very important topic today. I really appreciate it. And um, with that, I will let you take it away. Thanks, Diana. Hi, everybody. This is Dan Ruttero. Good morning. Welcome to our webinar. Um, as Diana mentioned, um, um, our law firm over here at Rudderow Law Group, we represent the owners and managers of RV parks as well as mobile home parks. And a lot of what we do, especially right now at the end of the year, is conducting our annual reviews of our clients' residency documents and making sure our RV registration agreements and rental agreements are compliant with the new laws that will be going into effect on January 1. And, addition, and in addition, of course, we're uh, working our way through, as everyone knows, these rather complicated uh, COVID eviction laws, which I think are gonna be around and be part of what we do here, at least through the first quarter of 2021. Um, today's webinar is gonna be about work campers. And I think we have a lot of information here and we will probably go to the full 40 minutes and then uh, cover any questions that you guys submit, uh, that you can submit right now as you listen to the presentation. Um, I'm very pleased this morning to be co-presenting with Damien. Um, so Damien, why don't you tell um, our listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, what your company does? Good morning, everybody. So uh, with Love at Recreation, um, I've been doing RV park insurance and campground insurance uh, for 22 years. Um, we do pretty much everything under the sun. So property, liability, umbrellas, auto, in the marine, work comp, um, you know, the employer's practice liability, all of those types of insurances that you need for your, your property, we would definitely be able to handle. Um, I've been working in California for that full 22 years. Uh, Levitt Recreation is the largest writer in the country of RV parks and campgrounds. We insure about 3,500 different properties. We do insure mobile home parks, mixture parks, that type of stuff. Um, so we can kind of help you out with whatever it is, but I also, you know, do other things as well in outdoor recreation. Um, so if you're thinking about doing amenities at your park, could be anything from the extreme extreme of zip lines and gun ranges to, hey, we have a pool or we sell propane. Um, but look forward to answering any questions and help anybody out that needs help. Thanks, Damian. Um, so as co-presenters, I think I'm gonna take the lead here and then just ask that Damian and Diana uh, jump in um, as I'm, uh, I'm kind of going through this. So let's get started. Um, first, we just wanted to say briefly that we know many of you uh, may not want to hear what we have to say today. So we thought it, we should say, first of all, please don't shoot the messenger, or actually, I guess, the messengers, Diana, Dan, and Damian, the three Ds. Um, for many, many years, uh, we all know that it's been an industry practice, especially for RV parks and campgrounds, to hire some of our customers or RV guests as work campers 
to do a variety of tasks and projects around our communities. Um, in years past, um, these work campers have been employed by the RV park as independent contractors. And oftentimes the work camper has been compensated with um, things like a free campsite. It's been a working relationship over the years that both the park community and the work camper, uh, I think have found mutually beneficial. I know I see websites for job postings for work campers all the time. I've, I've actually watched a lot of reality shows and documentaries on how people travel around the country in their RVs and they not only enjoy, but rely on going from place to place and getting some uh, temporary uh, you know, work camp or work at each place they visit. So if it's such a win-win situation, and I see this happening all over the United States and in California, then what's the problem and why are we having this webinar? The problem is uh, basically the government. Um, they want their money. And uh, with employees, the employer needs to, as you all know, withhold and deposit and report employment taxes withhold and pay social security and Medicare taxes and pay unemployment tax on wages paid. And what's happened over the recent years and what Diana and Damian and myself want to bring to your attention is that the government has basically been changing the laws and making it, they've been more strict as to when the hiring entity can claim that a particular worker is an independent contractor or when it can be regarded as an employee. Um, in fact, a lot of laws recently have been passed that oftentimes place the burden on the hiring entity to prove that their worker is an independent contractor. Otherwise, the government will presume that the worker is an employee. In the next, um, slide, we're going to talk about some of the factors that the IRS looks at. But just briefly, I wanted to mention that in California, under California law, last September in 2019, the governor signed Assembly Bill 5 into law. And Assembly Bill 5 required application of what the lawyers and maybe many of you know as the so-called ABC test to determine if workers um, that are working in California are employees or are they independent contractors for purposes of the California Labor Code, the Unemployment Insurance Code, and the Industrial Welfare Commission wage orders. Um, the law was adopted after the California Supreme Court adopted the ABC test in a case called Dynamics. Um, under this ABC test, um, what they do under this test in California is say that your worker is considered an employee unless you can prove like three things. You can show that the worker is free from your control and direction. You can show that the worker does this work that's outside the usual course of the entity's business. That is if the worker is doing something that you as a business don't usually do. And if the worker is engaged customarily in an independently, independently established trade um, that is of the same nature that's involved in the work performed. So I, I think this is really a timely issue. I know many of you have probably seen um, this in our last election in the propositions. Um, you saw a lot on the proposition that was passed with Uber drivers. And uh, what they're trying to do with, or did do with that proposition was kind of carve out a third type of animal. You have employees, you have independent contractors, and then Uber drivers wanted to have their own way of saying they're independent contractors. So I think that over the coming years, we're gonna see more litigation, more propositions passed regarding this battle between classifying people as employees, or classifying people, workers, as independent contractors. Um, but for today, let's go over uh, what the government's looking at and what and specifically as we go through this next slide. Hey, Dan, can I interject here for just a moment? Um, uh, 
coming from other types of industries, I've watched this happen um, for probably about the last five or six years. You know, they came into the fitness industry and now any fitness instructor has to be considered an employee. You know, they went in after spas and um, even some salons and things like that. So there's this movement, right, to start classifying employees correctly. And I think with the Uber situation, it now has is on the radar of the actual employees, of the consumers, of everybody. We've all seen it, all had some sort of, you know, um, aspect where it's touched our lives in a way. And so people are getting more savvy to this. And I think it's really a great time for our owners and operators to start paying attention because with the government start, starting to go after certain entities um, and then our consumers and employees becoming more savvy, um, we certainly want to make sure we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's in this area. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so with the IRS, just to kind of for discussion purposes, the IRS uses, uh, uses many factors. And I did not list all the factors here because we, we, we wouldn't have that much time to go over them. So what we've tried to do on this presentation is give you, you know, some general ideas, some general points of what the IRS is looking for. Um, but this list is kind of the short version. So what the IRS does is it looks at the particular worker and when someone's claiming that this worker is an independent contractor, the, uh, the IRS looks at several things. I mean, they look at, does this person that you're claiming is an independent contractor, do they pay their own business expenses out of their own pocket? Or is it a situation where they incur some type of you know, expense at Home Depot or at Lowe's at the hardware store and they come right back and you're reimbursing that person for these business expenses related to what they're doing. The IRS will also look at whether or not you as the park is, are paying this person a flat fee, like, you know, please, you know, uh, repair the fence all the way around the RV park for, you know, $12,500. Or is this a situation where the park is really hiring a camp worker to work on the fence and will pay them um, a certain hourly rate? The IRS will also look and see, is this person really an independent contractor? Meaning, are they working for the park? And can this person also work for other people and work for other communities? Or are they really just working for the park community? Um, the IRS will also look and see if they, the person that is a supposed uh, independent contractor, they'll look and see if that person has the ability and is in the practice of hiring and paying their own workers, their own subcontractors. And they'll also look and see, is this person really an independent contractor business? Are they a little business making a profit, profit and suffering a loss? or is there no risk to that person because they're just being paid hourly really by the park? So on the other hand, just so you guys get a flavor for how this works, on the flip side, um, the IRS factors that the IRS looks at that would indicate to the IRS this person no is really an employee is the flip side. Uh, if this person cannot work for others, then it's leaning more towards this person being an employee. If they pay them hourly, it's leaning more towards this person being an employee. Um, if this person doesn't really invest in their trade, they're just at, you know, at your, um, you know, they're just at your direction, they're going to be an employee. Uh, if they, like I said before, if they're going to Home Depot or Lowe's or a hardware store and getting direct reimbursement on almost all of their expenses from you, the IRS is more leaning towards this person being classified as an employee. And of course, if the park is giving specific instructions regarding their duties, uh, then it's more like an employee. I had a um, one of our 
uh, work campers, we were having this discussion and she mentioned to me, well, I am an independent contractor. And I said, oh, you are? What, you know, what do you do? And she said, well, I, I'm a hairstylist. And I said, well, unless you're cutting hair at the park, then that doesn't really apply. So just because they say they're an independent contractor, if they're doing work that pertains to the park, that's what it applies to. Exactly. Um, and then what happens from time to time is um, employers or the hiring entity has certain questions. And I'm sure you're, you're gonna have questions at the end of, end of this webinar, but some of the questions are, well, can't I, as the park community, can't I have them sign a contract? Can't we say in the contract and confirm in writing? I know, you know, park community owners are always saying to us lawyers, you lawyers are always trying to say that everything needs to be confirmed in writing. Um, so can't we just confirm in writing that they're an independent contractor? And that factor is really not determinative under, under California law, nor under uh, the IRS factors. Um, Otherwise, I think the government would, you know, catch on that just because you wrote down on a piece of paper, they're an independent contractor, um, you know, um, you're getting to not pay them the payroll taxes, etc. So that's not going to fly with the government. Um, some other things, too, that may not be uh, determinative in the end with the IRS is, you know, how long they're working for you, how their work is flexible. Um, and whether the relationship is temporary or short term. Um, we can all understand how this gets a little gray, um, that really this person came and did this job and only worked for me for three weeks. Can't this be an independent contractor? Are you telling me I have to go through all of the problems of going to my payroll company and getting them all set up on payroll? Um, the answer is, you know, yes, you need to do that because um, in the end, it's really not going to, um, you're not going to be able to claim they're an independent contractor just per se for the duration of work that they do. When you step back and you look at all of the laws and 15 factors or 20 factors. And when you step back and look at that ABC test I was talking about earlier under state law, really what the battle is, is how much control you're exercising over the worker. Um, you know, if you're hiring someone and you're telling them, I want you to go to the pool tomorrow morning and I want you to take this bucket and this brush and I want you to clean the patio furniture here, and I want you to do it this way, and then I want you to put the bucket and the brush back into the storage room, you know, you're exercising a lot of control over that worker. And the big picture here, when you exercise a lot of supervision and control over this worker, or over this work camper, it's, it's most likely, I'm not saying it's absolutely gonna be that case in every single situation, but you know, probably 90, 95% of the time, the government is gonna say, no, this person should be regarded as an employee. As opposed to you know, the flip side of the situation, what if you do have a pool and what if you call you know, um, Rotoro Pool Service and Rotoro Pool Service has their own business down the street and um, they have their own workers and they have their own trucks and the pool boy comes once a week and, and does their own thing. And you don't even know that that uh, pool boy is what that pool guy is even doing. You just know that he's cleaning the pool somehow according to his own procedures. And they come and they do their thing and they leave and they send you a bill. You know, that is more akin to an independent contractor. And so, you know, you're going to have a variety of jobs that you're going to want done at your community. I know they run the gamut to everything, the trash, the clubhouse, the pool, um, you know, the landscaping. Um, and as you try to get these temporary workers from who are visiting your park as camp workers, you need to be, uh, you need to be aware that if you are directing them, 
they are going to probably be considered um, employees and not in independent contractors. And um, so what that means is, you know, they're going to need to be on payroll and they're going to need to be paid on a minimum wage. I think many of you might have received uh, an email this morning from, I think it was California Manufacturer Housing Institute. They, they sent all of us a special bulletin about minimum wages and salaries that on January 1, the California minimum wage will increase to $14 per hour for employers with 26 or more employees and $13 per hour for employers with 25 or fewer employees. And then I noticed in their bulletin this morning, there are a lot of local minimum wages that were increased as well um, in a lot of cities, but just looking at my own clients and where my RV parks, my clients' RV parks are located, there looks like there's going to be increases in Belmont, in Mountain View, Palo Alto, uh, Redwood City, um, San Mateo, Santa Clara, Santa Rosa, and in Sonoma. And that's not the exhaustive list. I just don't want to go on and on and on with the list. But the list I have in front of me is pretty long. And those cities just sort of uh, jump out at me because I know I do have clients that have RV parks in those cities. So you're going to well, want to get with your payroll and your CPA. Go ahead, Diana. Well, I was going to say that, you know, it's common practice um, for a work camper to come in and perform a certain amount of work. Most of the time, they're typically at the front desk checking people in or doing, you know, some maintenance work um, in exchange for their site. Um, but if you take their hours, the number of hours you're requiring them to work, um, is that site actually valued at enough to be considered minimum wage? Um, when I look at this in a couple different situations with a few properties that I've had this conversation with, you know, the work camper was actually being paid about $3.75 an hour. Um, so you have to make sure that whatever your, whatever system and program you're putting in place that it's actually the equivalent of minimum wage and there are some there are some particulars with regards to that trade of lodging and how that needs to be managed it it can't just be a handshake and great you've got your space and now you're going to work 35 hours a week in the in the camp store um, so keep that in mind that everything that is a piece of the contract that you're putting together, it has to equal minimum wage. And um, if you have a married couple, so two people that are doing the work for you, you have to be paying them both minimum wage. So whatever that equals. So now you've got two people that are working, but only one site. Yeah, they both have to be getting the equivalent of minimum wage. That's a good point. And I had somewhere in this uh, presentation, I had it in a bullet point about being sure you document the situation with uh, the husband and the wife as park managers, because that is a kind of a common question. Yeah. Uh, Damien, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about workers comp? What, what situations you've seen people get in trouble with or what they're required to get, uh, what kind of insurance they're required to have with, uh, with, uh, with employees? Sure, and I'm gonna back up too to that last one. Um, I've had the conversation where somebody says, oh, I need to meet minimum wage. Well, their site is worth $800. And you're like, okay, how did you arbitrarily come up with that number just to meet the minimum wage? I mean, if there was a smell test and you were like, okay, what do you charge your normal customer? And they're like, oh, well, $600 a month. Or, hey, we're just gonna say that it's $800 a month for her and $800 a month for him, but really that site is only $800, but they're a couple and they're both working for you. So to me, those are those types of things that when you start getting into a pickle and somebody's asking you the questions or drilling down a little bit, um, that makes it a little difficult for you and puts kind of puts you in the hot seat. So just be careful of that. Um, Cause I've seen that happen quite a few different times. Um, but anyhow, getting on to the work comp. Um, one of the biggest things that we run into is you might be doing some of this stuff for tax issues. Um, maybe you don't want to do the bookkeeping. Um, maybe you're changing your ways of doing business to accommodate your work camper 
and you have multiple different reasons. At the same time, we as the insurance industry don't necessarily care what those other reasons are. And I don't mean to sound bad on that, but if that person gets hurt, you can still have work comp and still do everything else wrong. Um, so we wanna make sure that you're kind of aware of that. At the end of the day, what we see is an employee typically gets hurt or a work camper gets hurt, they're expecting you to pay for their medical bills. And then it's, if you don't have the work comp, what are kind of some of the penalties that come into play? You know, and, and there's some pretty steep ones in California, especially, so be aware of that type of stuff. At the same time, if you are gonna tell me that they're an independent contractor, we're okay with that, but we then say, okay, you should have certificates of insurance from that independent contractor. They should have their own commercial liability insurance. They should have their own work comp insurance. They should have their own commercial auto insurance before they ever come onto your property. And you should have proof of that in your file. Because if you do have work comp, even if the work comp is for yourself and you have an audit, that's where the insurance company says, okay, show us the certificates of insurance for all your independent contractors. If you don't have those certificates on file, then what they do is they charge you like those independent contractors are your employees anyways. So, you know, there's a combination of a few different things there. If it's a legitimate electrician coming into your park and is an a is a contractor, you sh should be asking for that information and having that on file. Um, so those are some of the big ones for me to definitely point out to people. Um, one of the good things too, is if you're buying work comp insurance and let's say an employee gets hurt, if they decide to sue you because you put them in a harmful situation, it's what we call stopgap liability coverage that's normally included under your work comp policy. But if they accept payment for medical, that's where normally they're waiving that right to be able to sue you. But if you don't have that, one, you don't have the insurance coverage if they sue you. So, or, and or you don't have the medical insurance to pay for their medical bills and you still could be on the hook to pay those medical bills. So what happens tomorrow when the guy says, hey, I strained my back and now it results into six years of medical bills and chiropractors and so forth, all because we were trying to save a thousand bucks, you're gonna spend way more than a thousand bucks in the medical bills for that guy. Um, and he'll probably win the lawsuit if he sued you. Damien shared with me a story of um, a gentleman who wasn't technically even a work camper, but he started, you know, coming every morning and sweeping snow off the walkway up to the store. Very realistic scenario for you guys, which is why I bring it up, you know, and then he'd go in and, oh, here, have a free cup of coffee. Thanks for wiping off the, the step or, you know, the walkway. Every day, then he starts walking you know, sweeping the walkway and getting a free cup of coffee. Now what we've created is an unspoken contract between you and this guy who's now your permanent, you know, walkway sweeper until he breaks his hip. And now what is he? What is he defined as? So in this case, and Damien, you'll have to refresh my memory um, quickly on, you know, what the under what ended up happening. But in this case, you know, the gentleman slips, he breaks his hip. Now what? you're on the hook for all of his medical. And without workers comp, that is definitely gonna cost you a lot more than it would have had you paid him as an employee. Yeah, so that was an interesting one. Um, and it was in a state where they were, re you're not required to have work comp until you have like five employees. So to me, that's a perfect example of they give you enough rope to hang yourself. Um, in that circumstance. So this gentleman was scooping the walks when, when it snowed. He was doing it as a volunteer, not a big deal. And then what happened was the park owner kind of was like, you know what, I should give him some money for doing that job. And so she was actually giving him a little bit of a stipend every time he did it. 
So it was kind of an unspoken thing that it was just happening. And then he did kind of become that employee that's getting paid cash. So it wasn't anything big. It was all under the table. And then he slips and falls. He goes to the hospital. The hospital asks, where did you get hurt? How did you get hurt? Oh, you were doing work for the RV park. Oh, okay. Let our billing department call the RV park and get their work comp insurance. They call the RV park. We don't have work comp. He's not an employee. He's a volunteer. Well, we got a hurt guy in our hospital and we want to get paid. So where do we go from here? And that's kind of how that situation goes downhill real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next slide here, and I, I, I'm just trying to give you like little headlines, and, and I wrote this, how would I get caught if I keep doing independent contractors? You know, it's not so much that, hey, I'm going around and doing independent contractors or work campers as independent contractors, and I'm violating the law, and I'm going to get caught and get in trouble. That's certainly what basically we're saying, but let's Let's pull back a little bit and say that, as I said earlier, there are certain criteria that the government uses to determine whether or not your work camper is an employee or independent contractor. You may decide to go to bat with uh, the government, uh, you know, with your attorney and with their CPA, and you may um, convince the government that this work camper is in fact an independent contractor. And if that happens, great. But the reason why we're doing this webinar for you today, and we understand you have a variety of people coming onto your property doing a variety of tasks, it's just that this trend of having these work campers do something on your property at your direction, you know, the point of the takeaway of today's webinar is chances are it's probably more likely than not that the government is going to regard that work camper as an employee and disagree with you and say to you that you, this person is not a, an employee. This person, from what you tell me about what he does or she does on your property, I, the IRS, or I, the California government, labor department, whatever it is, um, we see this person as a employee. And since you've been wrongfully treating them as an independent contractor, you know, here are the penalties. And, um, and there's many penalties and there's paying back taxes. Um, there's these taxes, there's reimbursement of wages, there's payment of penalties. Um, yes, some of them can get very expensive. Um, and I don't want to be on this webinar telling you the world's going to come to an end. Um, the point of this is just to give you information that you can evaluate, which is probably your work camper is going to be regarded as an employee. And if you're always treating them as independent contractors, um, given how the climate has changed politically with our government and how aggressive governments are getting lately with getting their taxes and getting their money, you might come up against the government wanting to be aggressive with your practice at your park. And, um, and then you may, if the government disagrees with you and you can't convince them that this worker is an independent contractor, the government may impose certain penalties. And there's a variety of different penalties uh, depending on if it's the IRS or the state government and what have you. Damien, do you uh, know of any penalties lately or can think of any that people have been hit with or has it not come up le lately with your uh, insurance practice? No, I mean, that type of thing would be in between a park and the state and, and most RV park owners probably aren't gonna tell me that they got the hammer dropped on them. Um, so a lot of times we find out that it's it's more of they had an employee that got hurt and now they're trying to secure work comp insurance because they had something happen and they don't normally go into the detail of of that and try to keep that hush hush so i don't have okay. any good stories on that one on um we mentioned uh and diana just mentioned something about volunteers 
And as I go through some of these um, website job listings for uh, work campers, I see that every single <laughs> job offering seems to be, hey, come be a volunteer and hey, be a volunteer and, and you get a free web, a website uh, to be a volunteer. If you look at it closely, a lot of those volunteer um, postings are from the state, uh, the state parks, parks that are operated by the state. And I know it's gonna make you sick to hear this, but there are some different rules that allow volunteers to work at state parks. Um, I don't think, I think it's very rare that you can, uh, uh, as a uh, private RV park, that you can claim people are uh, volunteers and that that's gonna work. It doesn't work that way for, uh, for your park. So just keep that in mind because I think that that's really maybe caused a lot of confusion when we see all of these volunteer postings and why can't I do a volunteer posting as well? And that's exactly the place that they're gonna go when they start cracking down on this. You know, so if, if the government decides, well, we've looked at fitness centers, we've looked at salons, we're, you know, tackling Uber and Lyft, we're, we're starting to tackle DoorDash and all these, these things, you know, they're gonna go to those listings and they're gonna look to see what you're saying and who you're hiring and what you're offering. Um, and that's the, that's the first place that they're going to, they're going to strike. Exactly. Exactly. Cause it didn't make sense to me when I looked at millions of not millions, but I, I literally looked at dozens and pages and pages of job offerings for volunteers at, at state parks. My research, when I tried to research that, uh, this past week was that, you know, there are special volunteer rules for our state governments. So, uh, don't, don't, you know, be sure if you're thinking, oh no, this can be a volunteer, I really would recommend that you have that verified with your CPA or your tax attorney, uh, exactly what you're doing um, and go, uh, go from there. Um, so we're at uh, 11.35, 11.36. Let's just finish up with um, a couple slides here then on what are our recommendations for best practices regarding work campers. Um, you know, the best practice probably to save yourself a lot of grief and a lot of problem and a lot of disputes and maybe a lot of litigation is to um, treat your work camper as an employee. And when we talk about documentation, if you're ever audited or you ever get quote unquote in trouble with uh, the government, you know, it's important to have documented the hours that they work, whether that be time clocks or timesheets to issue your W-2s. And this is Diana, where I had it here, what your point was, document the worker status and hours for both the husband and wife uh, park managers. Because um, husband and wife park managers, it's a great thing. They maybe, you know, they live at the park um, and that's a very common situation, but you can see sort of the issues with that. I mean, what's the husband doing? What's the wife doing? And how are they being compensated uh, each as an individual, even though they're just, the, that they're married? Um, generally- Jump ahead. in there too, Dan. Um, on that time sheet, we have seen a lot of lawsuits for the failure to time card people. And it, it, there's a combination of a lot of different things that come up with that. So let's say they dump the trash at 10 o'clock at night because they were like, well, if I don't, the crows are going to get into it tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. before I get on shift. So I might as well take care of it now. But then again, he gets hurt doing that off hours. Mm -hmm. Is that really a work comp claim or is he a volunteer at that point? Mm -hmm. Or the horror story that I have is I had a campground in Colorado where they didn't do a time card. They basically hired the person. She was working on the property. When she was let go, she turned around and sued the park saying that they had hired her to be a full-time manager that was there and required to be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They didn't have anything to fight that battle and they ended up um, winning or the 
the employee ended up winning the lawsuit where they had to pay back pay for two years on basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week at minimum wage. It was crazy. That park ended up going belly up because they couldn't afford $5,000 a month in restitution payments to this lady. Wow. Well, and that brings up an excellent point, Damien. One of the things that I, I haven't seen on here yet, and Dan, you may be getting to it on this next slide, is a contract. I cannot tell you how many of my parks do not have contracts with their work campers. They have nothing in writing. And I will tell you one of the biggest questions every October, we are slammed with calls from park members saying, I can't get this work camper out of my park. How do I evict them? They, they've now been laid off as a work camper. I don't have a contract. How do I get them out? Well, at that point, you know, you basically have to go through the eviction process. And now when you go through the eviction process, that work camper has a pretty good case to go back to the government and say, well, you know, I was technically an employee. And now you've got multiple entities coming at you. So if there's definitely one takeaway, you absolutely have to have in writing specifics as to what that person has been hired for, their hours, when they're on, when they're off. Um, you know, it's all too easy for somebody to go knock on the work camper's door and go, hey, you know what, can I da 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 da? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I'm off, but let me go run in the office and get that for you. And that's, you know, that's a huge problem right there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, from a lawyer standpoint, we do a lot of evictions, evicting tenants um, who have a tenancy in the park, whether that tenancy is a verbal tenancy or a tenancy that's reflected with a registration agreement under the RV code or even a rental agreement. Occasionally, we deal with the situation Diana is talking about. It's happened maybe even three times this year uh, with our files where we've had um, the person is a park manager and the park manager has been terminated and now they won't leave the site and they hire our firm to evict that park manager. There are special rules, uh, special um, eviction laws about how you do an unlawful detainer um, complaint uh, for this situation when the employee is terminated. The and we've done three of them successfully this year. Um, I think I want to just add to what Diana's saying is the only issue I've had with them is yes, you need a, it's good to have a good employment agreement and then have that employment agreement reviewed by your attorney because your, your relationship with your employee should be at will, meaning you should be able to terminate them at will. And for whatever reason, we've been getting employment contracts that, um, that say something different and make it a little uncertain how we can terminate this employee. So um, I would say on this point with Diana, I agree with Diana, very important to document agreements, uh, but also you know, have an, a, a park attorney or an employment attorney look at your agreements uh, because it, it happens. It's happened three times this year in my office that we've had three different clients uh, terminate the park employee and then they didn't know and they, had, they were frustrated how to turn around and evict them from the site. I think that the um, other thing about that Diana and Damien is the on-call situation. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very common. Um, from my research on this topic, uh, you really have to pay people for their time being on call mm -hmm. um, because on call is something like, you know, well, can I just hire this person to be on call? Meaning, you know, we're a very sleepy little RV park and maybe every four hours at 8.30 at night, if a new guest arrives at the park office and wants to rent a space, then you're on call and you need to go to the front desk and uh, check them in. The problem is, is that they really are on the clock. I mean, they can't, you know, drink alcohol and do what they want to do while they're on call. They certainly cannot drink alcohol, be under the influence and be working at the front desk and, and uh, checking this person in. 
Um, so I would get with your, uh, uh, your park attorney and uh, be very careful when you're starting to say, well, I'm just gonna pay this person this amount of money to be on call. Can't I do that and go lower than uh, minimum wage? Um, we should probably get to some questions. So we have a little bit of time to answer those. Sure. Um, I do have one here in the Q&A and feel free if you guys have questions to send those in. Um, could a misclassified employee also be due unpaid sick time, health insurance and vacation time as per your employee benefits policy? Um, yeah, it's my understanding that, um, you know, if they are then reclassified as an employee, you're going to owe them sick time. And if you provide benefits, you're going to owe them those benefits as well. Um, is that yeah. correct, Dan? Yeah, I believe that's correct. And there's a lot in the law that I've seen about paying back taxes. Um, and um, you just don't want to go there. It can get really expensive how much back, back pay and back taxes you have to do uh, once there's been a dispute and a determination that the government disagrees with your classification. Um, and then I know that there was a comment in here about hiring an LLC or even properly registered general partnership of a husband and wife. Um, it's, it's again, my understanding that you can't hire an LLC or a husband and wife as an actual, you know, a, a, a general partnership as an employee. Do you have any comments? Well, on yeah, that? I think that uh, that's a good point. Uh, if you talk with your lawyer, you might want to explore that actually, that idea. Uh, in the sense that if you have documentation that you're hiring uh, an LLC, a separate uh, entity, um, you know, can that be evidence that they are an independent contractor? So I would say that that is worth exploring. Uh, just talk to your lawyer about how that works. Um, uh, but, you know, the government is going to be scrutinizing your documentation uh, for things like that. Um, let's see, we have another comment, um, have a similar sans the accident. I'm guessing they're supposed to have workers comp based on this conversation. Given California, I assume my risk is high. It is someone who volunteered to trim trees and demo old structures because they wanted to feel productive, be outside and vent stress constructively. I did not solicit anyone for this work. There's no schedule, no hours recorded, her own tools, not even gas money requested. I asked routinely what she would like in trade, nothing requested except one vehicle when her partner offered to fix a tractor, which is what he does for a living elsewhere as trade for his time and skill. I manage the property this occurs on. The property owner doesn't know about this. Your conversation sounds like the owner could be liable for workers comp in spite of his distance of knowledge of the situation and unsolicited volunteerism. Yeah, yeah Damien, I don't know if I'll let you join, join, try, uh, join in and, and comment, but I mean, um, you know, a couple of principles there, uh, principles of law that are always applicable is that people are charged with knowing the law and saying I was ignorant of the law is not really going to fly with the government. Um, also, my other point of it, it is I know in the day to day workings, we all want to be nice and uh, we want to have good relationships with other human beings. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's difficult to you know, sort of have that backbone every single moment of every single day and, uh, and comply with the employment laws and the wage hour laws. I know that, you know, you might have an employee who's not taking their wage hour break in the morning and not taking their break at lunchtime and not taking their break in the afternoon. And you're saying to yourself, why can't my employee go and do what they're supposed to do, take their required breaks under the wage hour laws and you have to get on them and say, I'm sorry, you can't just work on that rush project from 8.30 to 12, you must go take your break. And so similarly with this, someone wants to be very nice, someone wants to volunteer to do something, someone is taking compensation with a pickup truck or whatever it is, you know, don't do that practice. You're gonna get yourself in trouble try to stay within the bounds of the law. And that's why we're here today at the webinar to talk about it. You know, um, we know that it's difficult and challenging and expensive to actually classify all these people as um, employees. 
But I know that there are also times, I had a park earlier this year say they had about 12 work campers on site. Well, maybe we don't need that many. Maybe there are some things that you can do to tailor this a little bit differently that you can do it the right way um, while also you know, covering those shifts you need at the park. Um, this isn't to say, you know, just abandon all your practices and, and do this or else, but to really shine a little bit of light on what is actually happening out there and, and how you can be held liable if a situation comes up. You know, we see the other side of that when these situations actually do occur. And it's really unfortunate, just like Damien had that situation where the park ended up going under because of it. So we don't want any of, I don't want any of my members put in that position. Um, so while we might seem like the bad guy, we're really trying to just kind of broadly open your eyes to what could actually happen. And in this question, it truly, it sounds like it's truly a volunteer. So the, to me, there are true volunteers and then there are people that are trying to say that they're a volunteer or say that they're an independent contractor and still compensating them. If they're truly a volunteer, okay, so be it. Now, here's the downside to that. One of our parks has a camper. They're setting up for a Friday night, big screen TV it needs to be mounted on the wall. RV park guest comes over, offers to help. TV, they fall off the ladder, TV lands on them, paralyzes the guy. We pay out $4.5 million under their general liability because he was not an employee. There was no funny business going on with an employee independent contractor. He was truly a volunteer. But do you think their insurance is going to want to be on that, knowing that, hey, they probably were okay with having volunteers get on ladders, do tree trimming, demolish buildings. When you look at that kind of exposure, those are high risk. Those are high risk for the work comp market. They're high risk for independent contractors. And that's where then the last thing you wanna do is to have a volunteer be doing those high risk type stuff because you're gonna ultimately pay for it when you go get your renewal or get non-renewed or have to go to surplus lines, to me, that's where be careful on what you allow volunteers to do. You still might do a waiver form where you're letting them know that, hey, you are a volunteer and we're not paying for your medical if something were to happen because you are here voluntarily. Um, so there's other things that you might look at in that regard when we talk about true volunteers. Um, but I don't want to discourage people because there are a lot of good folks out there that do just want to lend a hand. Just make sure the tasks are good tasks for volunteers. All right. Well, Great point, Damien. And I think, let's see. It looks like we have another question. Um, our campground is very small. Are we required to have a manager on site 24 seven? Susan, that's an excellent question because it is one we get in the office frequently um, and, and uh, it does come up. So um, are they required to have a, an onsite manager or somebody 24 seven? Uh, I know that there is the rule that you do in the mobile home park is if, if this is an RV, if you want, I'll just double check what the rule are about on site. What is it that you tell most members, Diana? Um, they, as far as I am aware, they are required to have somebody on site. It doesn't need to be the manager. So you might have like your manager there during the day and then somebody else that is available or on call in the evenings. Um, or at night. So there does need to be somebody and it might depend on number of sites. So I need to confirm this, Susan, but it might be 50 sites or more. You have to have somebody on site, I believe is, is the ruling. You know, I'll double check and I can get you know an answer back. Sure. sure. And from an insurance standpoint too, that is one of the com or one of the questions on most of the insurance companies' applications is do you have somebody that lives or is on property for the case of an emergency? It's not to say that that's a golden rule, but they do like to see that and most of your standard carriers would decline to cover because they're concerned that there's nobody there. 
yeah, no matter the size of parking. If the person ask, asking this question can give Diana the specifics, RV park, how many spaces, and Diana, if you want me to uh, confirm with you later offline uh, the rules, I'd be happy to do that. We can get that person the answer. I just don't want to do it off the cuff during this presentation. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, another question, is there, is there a way to insulate the property owner from liability for work trade issues? Uh, I think we've talked about that today, um, uh, about the uh, best practices mm -hmm. with hiring them as work campers. Um, so I think the best practices for insulating your liability is to review who's working for you and if those people are on your payroll or if they're not on your payroll, and if they're not on your payroll and you wanna consider them independent contractors, what is your documentation regarding the fact that they're an independent contractor? And as Damian brought up, have you asked for their insurance? Do you have something from them where they are an independent contractor, they have their own insurance, should something happen to their workers while they're on your property. That's important in case there's an injury, but that kind of documentation too will help insulate you from liability that you've got the proper documentation in the file showing that this person is an independent contractor, that they really are, have their own company, they're responsible for their own company, their own monies as they come onto your property to work. Do we have any more questions or is that about it? Hello? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> Susan said 21 campsites, no hookups. Mobile Home Park has 37 sites, which I know does not require on site manager if less than 50 MH sites. And then her number is here, so we can get back to you, Susan. And then Cassidy also asked do they have to be on site or is on call sufficient? So um, we will get some clarification on the on-site and on-call and um, and what those definitions actually are, and we'll be happy to put it out to all the attendees, um, anyone, everyone who attended today to um, kind of confirm that. Um, that. That is, I think, wait, oh wait, we have more questions. They just keep coming right in. Um, what about volunteers who come wrap Xmas presents organize holiday items for storing, decorating clubhouse, no payment given or offered. Um, okay, I, I think maybe I know people are asking these questions and they're in the queue, but I thought Damien gave a very good, um, Damien gave a very good example of what could happen. So when the question is, what happens when we have volunteers come over and gift wrap some presence. I think Damien's example of what happens when we have a volunteer come over and help hang the TV is sort of the same thing. I yeah. mean, you know, it, it's gift wrapping. I appreciate it's not getting on a ladder, but it's, I'm doing this for the park. I'm gift wrapping these things. I, I've got all the wrapping paper laid out on the table. I'm doing this for the park's benefit as a volunteer. And now I think I'll just run to the restroom and I'm on my way to the restroom, I slip and fall on some water on the floor. You know? Right. So, and that's uh, where in that situation, I would say, yeah, you can have that volunteer and not worry about, hey, am I covered? Because your general liability, which I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of all of you have general liability insurance that would cover your volunteers, true volunteers, where you get into the problem is when they're a work camper and they're not really a volunteer. When you're talking about this idea of Chris, you know, wrapping Christmas presents, that's not what you're in the business of doing, right? right. So that's not your business. They're not doing something that is, um, is part of your day-to-day -day business. So in that sense, they could actually be classified as a volunteer. But the minute they answer the phone, they have a key, they step behind the counter, they sweep your walk, they, you know, collect money, um, they do a sale, they go on and register somebody, anything like that pertains to your actual what you do um, within those, those four walls of your park, um, they are now you know, technically considered an employee. 
and getting compensated for it too. Volunteers don't get compensated. Correct. Thank you. Um, I think that's about it. I don't see any other questions. Do we have any last minute questions before we wrap up? And then please know that both myself, Dan and Damien are all available. So if something does come up afterwards, um, you know, please just give us a call and let us know and we will be happy to, um, to answer those questions for you. Uh, thank you everyone. And thank uh, my thanks to Damien and Diana for, uh, for putting this on. We appreciate it. And, and everyone have a safe and happy holiday.